someone was this sounds very la woo woo um but thinking about monetary exchange as a being it could be seen as a spiritual act in some ways like mm. you drew, did a drawing that connected to someone and he found found it so valuable it made him feel like he was participating in the experience by giving you something yeah. that represented the value and now he gets to have it and enjoy yeah. it how is that impure let's no i don't think i don't you know what i mean I, yeah, like i, I feel agree. like seeing it that way isn't is a is a counter argument to the I think thing. the purity thing has to do with a lot with academia, and I think yeah. part of the reason that that shit is dying out now is because most of us can't work in that industry. I don't know if you teach. I, not I, anymore. Yeah, like if you have tenure and you're not worried about fucking losing your job, you can jerk off all you want on the canvas. You can write one novel and then yeah. wait seven years. <laughs> Welcome to What's My Thesis. I'm your host, Javier Proenza. Every week, my guests and I share the answers we found to the questions we have. Join us as we explore and expand our worldview and ask, what's my thesis? And today, my guest is Megan Reed. Do you go or do you do do you ask people to say e-read? No, no, that's okay. just because Instagram. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you, that's not even what you go by as an artist? No, it's just, it was my Instagram handle. But my name is pronounced Megan. You wouldn't know oh, that. Oh, Megan? Megan. Megan. Oh, I'm. Is it spelled Megan, and I'm just ignoring it because I'm just. No, it's spelled Megan, so you're fine. Oh, okay, it's but it's said Megan. My parents did that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> your parents are fun. I like them already. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you from? Since we're talking about parents, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. And I've been in LA for five years. Are you one of the Bay Area people that hates LA, or do you? No. Okay. But when I, you'd be surprised about that rivalry. You know about it, obviously. Yeah. But there's such a sense of betrayal when people leave. Really? Yeah. But uh, everyone secretly wants to, they're really curious aren't about Aren't people LA. leaving just because they're poor? Or <laughs> there's a huge mass exodus. Three of us in this building are Bay Area people. So. I would imagine that that's not a betrayal. Like the city betrayed you guys, right? Yeah, that's how right? I feel. Yeah, yeah. It's a very hard place to be an artist. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. I don't even, I mean, I know, I know a little bit about the scene just because I know some artists from there, but is it a centralized art scene or is it decentralized? Mm, How would you describe question. that? I just think it's a really small town. People, San Francisco is a big city in some ways, but in terms of, and I'm going to be killed for saying all this, but. Um, oh, I'm, I'm happy to get you canceled <laughs> in San Francisco and never be allowed to go back. I'll take credit for that too. <laughs> it's just a very, I feel like it's kind of provincial and there's a certain amount of, I mean, it has been welcoming to the counterculture in the sixties and, but I don't know if there's ever, I mean, there's a huge visual art tradition. So I'm contradicting myself. Like at Ruby Neri, my studio mate's dad was Manuel Neri and mm -hmm. you know, there, there were some really important things happening in the sixties and the seventies. It just, just felt maybe it's always economically been stratified and that's part of the hostility, I think. There's a certain amount of um, condescension, even though people may not mean it that way, because San Francisco was the more European established city and L.A. was sort of the Wild West. Mm -hmm. And I just learned this reading Mike Davis's City of Courts that like the financial institutions were all in San Francisco and they were funding a lot of the infrastructure down here. So there's always been sort of a yeah. imbalanced relationship. But then. I don't know. So I just think, uh, is it a decentralized art scene? There were people who would disagree with me. I just felt like it was a hard to survive there. And then it was hard to watch gallery after gallery die or mm -hmm. the really limited funding um, just for visual arts. And then on the flip side of that, my brother's a musician there and it's a thriving music scene. And I don't think he oh, would yeah. ever leave. He loves it and it just seems really exciting and vibrant. Well, it seems like the cities that are thriving for artists are usually very hostile to them anyway right <laughs> like, yeah like la is not like unhostile in, in terms it's definitely not new york but yeah. like i'm just thinking in in descending order of like new york yeah. probably hard to live in if you're not you know if you're it, i would say la is okay for like middle class artists but mm. you still gotta hustle you you're mm. not gonna like just live off of that entirely yeah i could conceive of actually making a living entirely from gigging though you know in, yeah in, in, like uh, doing bars and whatnot yeah, I mean, I guess that's the question anywhere, but I don't know. I San Francisco was good to me. I left there really quickly, and I did went to college in New York City, and so I think that's also framed my view of it. But I, I really like big, huge, messy, yeah, dirty, disgusting cities, and 
San Francisco is, a, is not that. It's a beautiful, like awe-inspiring natural beauty. It's small, you know, compared to others. And so I feel like moving to L.A. just is more my speed. It's big, dirty, and disgusting. And yeah. It's definitely that. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway. No, I mean, I like I like L.A. I, I do get what you're saying. There is something to that is different this city i would say like because okay we talked a little bit off air that i live in rome yeah. and then i also spent some time in florence and oh. i know why people in new york are so hostile because it's like i've experienced that level yeah. of like a city that gets flooded with tourists yes. and you can't get from point a to point b yeah it's a fucking nightmare it's a nightmare yeah and you don't really see that here because you're in your car they're all concentrated in places that you probably never go um, Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. San Francisco, too. I, I don't want to completely just it. Like, you know, uh, we, we grew up in the suburbs, obviously, but um, not obviously, but I did. Um, uh, but the scene in Oakland and the East Bay is sort of similar to, I think, maybe some of the stuff happening or did happen for a while in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. the, they're distinct identities. And Oakland's just, Oakland sometimes feels like L.A. to me, but yeah. smaller. And I love Oakland. Oakland is great, but the fucking football fans are always scare me. Like Raider Nation, there's nothing but more terrible. they're terrifying. here too. I know, they, but the, <laughs> like that's what I mean. Like ev it, they seem uh, scary. They yeah. seem like people that don't have a country. <laughs> yeah, my older brother is. Uh, when we were growing up, he was a big A's and Raiders fan, and then they left. Yeah, to go Where to LA. They? Oh, okay. For the first time, or I guess the only time, and he cried in his room. I can say that because he was like eight or something, but um. And then he explained to me, then now they're in Vegas, so they are sort of without a country. And yeah, yeah. It, it is that's the why weird. they say Raider Nation. It's sort of not about the city, it's about the identity. I know. That's what makes it fucking terrifying. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I feel like I see more of it down here. It's funny. But. Uh, did you know that, like, uh, I found this out recently that Buccaneers, the term comes from um, when, uh, like, the, the, the Buccaneers, basically what they did was cook a specific kind of pig and that was the buccaneer or maybe the steak that they used or i don't know it's like the least aggressive uh because they were come over with ships and uh, i'm like secondhand telling a podcast that i listen to <laughs> wow but it's that's pretty crazy like you think of it like buccaneers i always thought it was like i always thought it was something like akir, akin to raping and pillaging which i thought it was problematic but now i'm like oh that's like such a tame name for oh just a pig way to eat a pig grill a pig yeah, I mean, that's where the buccaneers get, because that was their main source of sustenance, because they would live on ships. So the little pigs were, I mean, I, I'm totally not 100% sure on this, but I like the idea of something so like manly, just yeah. being like little, little tiny guinea pigs on pikes. Yeah, just a little sustenance. <laughs> Domesticated. An, an homage to our food source. They were like uh, nomadic farmers, essentially. Wow. Because they had these, I mean, that's... Like, I guess, a nomadic pig farmers, essentially. But Buccaneers, that sounds like maybe a Native American name? No, term? it's Buccaneer. It's French. Ah. I mean, this is, what, Tampa Bay? Yeah. Okay. It's they, sophisticated. They can keep it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it reminds me, I was watching The Bear. Have you seen this show? No. It's like, every, maybe mostly ladies are talking about it, but it's about this chef who inherits his brother's restaurant in Chicago, like a little sandwich shop. And he's coming from New York City, I think, like high-end Michelin-starred restaurants. But it was interesting the way he was like, create, you know, cooking the meat. And I thought, it, 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 it relates to the Buccaneers part of it, that we don't think that's manly behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Unless you're in Argentina, and then it's like the manliest thing. Yeah. 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 Or Italy, I guess. I need Argentine friends so that I can like, go to their barbecues. Yeah. Because that shit I is. Me too. I don't have any. I know. Oh, well. <laughs> well, cool. Um, so, so the, okay. So then you grew up in Oakland and you came Well, I grew here. up in even worse. Oh, it's, like, it's like the, the valley, basically. The valley of oh, their suburbs? Yeah. Because it's seven miles by seven miles, the city, and then everything else surrounding it is... Uh, is that what it is? I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> but that makes sense because there's a magazine, Seven by Seven, and that must be it. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I think yeah, the so. The city's really not very huge. It's just exhausting to walk because of the hills completely almost impossible yeah um and then yeah i think it's like only a million 
people population. Like San Jose is a bigger yeah, city. Yeah, I could see that. Um, I don't know what the population of Oakland is, but then Oakland, Berkeley, and then, yeah. And then over the Oakland Hills is where I grew up. Do you know if the Giants Stadium is in San Francisco itself? Giants Stadium. Like the baseball stadium? Never mind. Uh, yeah, uh, it is actually. It is? Okay. It's, um, it's... <laughs> I was like, fuck, I'm on our podcast. <laughs> I don't know why I blanked. Yeah, it's right. It's it's right along the water, McCovey Cove. Because um, yeah, the home runs go out into yeah. the into the bay. Yeah, which which I do remember. But like that's fucking crazy. You got a seven mile by seven mile city, and you have, in a, like you make room for a stadium. That's like it yeah. that seems wild to and me. And then they added the Warrior Stadium, Chase Stadium. What's what sport is that? That's for basketball. Oh, okay. So it's probably an arena. That's an arena, and that's also in the city. And yeah. I haven't lived there since that opened. But I, I mean. Where I went to grad school was in San Francisco, and the traffic from the ball games was just insane. Oh yeah, so the, now I can't even imagine. But people were saying that Inglewood is going to go up in price, and like I yeah. don't know with those new stadiums, we'll see. Yeah, <laughs> no, who wants to live around that? Who wants to be a fucking? Uh, who wants to be basically a parking lot attendant yeah. in their own house? Yeah, you yeah, know? no, not good. But um, but it's interesting too because the Warriors were playing in Oakland. Like, basically, Oakland's been decimated of its teams, which yeah. is just sort of the history. I mean, maybe that's another economic reality to think about with the Bay Area. This disappointing that there is a hierarchy, like a blue-collar, white-collar hierarchy. You know yeah. what I mean? Even the teams play out that way. Well, I think LA, I think California has a hard time with that because even LA's teams, like, no one gives a fuck. How many times have we lost the Rams? The Rams are, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. hopping around, too. Yeah. That's interesting. I yeah. never thought of that. But so the A's, my brothers explain this to me all the time. They, they are just perpetually underfunded, but then they, they're really good at f choosing underperformers who then go elsewhere because they- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's kind of a business model in sports a lot of times. Yeah. They'll like, their ambition is just to make good players. Unfortunately, that's my team in soccer. Uh, yeah. Roma, they, they're like, every time they, they've had like, Vucinich, Mosala, all these great players, and yeah. they buy them at like bargain basement bargain price. basement prices, and then you know all of a sudden I don't know why Mosala just all of a sudden cracked, and he was just playing like a fucking animal. Yeah, but he didn't have a team behind him, so then he goes to mm -hmm. Liverpool and he becomes a superstar. So it, why is that? I don't understand that they make money off of it, you know, because all uh, of these, especially I don't know how it is over here, but over there, basically I own your child, like mm -hmm. over here you have input on their training like yeah over there i buy out your child your child goes to school like fucking lives breathes and smokes soccer yeah and um and oh right yeah yeah, yeah. and and then like what they what these schools do is develop these players that they can sell yeah because everybody has a transfer it's not that even was like, like a transfer david field. beckham yeah. i know he's not really that great of a player but i remember he's, hearing yeah, he's all right yeah. i mean he was not the the thing about English soccer is that they think they're the fucking best, but every World Cup, they suck ass. I know. I lived <laughs> there for a minute, and I'm like, they're terrible, but they yeah. have rabid fans. Yeah. I'm not anyone to talk, though, because my team, Italy, is fucking garbage. They just lost to Argentina. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, I'm glad It's Messi. weird where capitalism... Uh, it's weird to like accept mediocrity for a long-range profit motive. Like, how dissatisfying... But that's sort People, of the perpetual heartbreak my brothers feel about the A's all the time. Yeah, it goes like that. But although, wasn't A's the Moneyball team? Yeah. So, I mean, they kind of did revolutionize. They made a movie about it. That I made know. a movie. Their whole algorithm was yeah. genius. I mean, Brad Pitt was a genius in, <laughs> in, in, in that era of baseball. <laughs> He's been good at a lot of things. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> he killed some fucking Nazis, too. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> killed the Manson family, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't watched that one yet, but yeah, he's... I'm spoiling a movie I haven't seen yet because it's been spoiled, you motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Actually, Tarantino spoiled it himself. Is that the recent one, Bullet? The no, last, that, last the uh, the Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, last uh, days of Hollywood or something like that. Once upon a time. Once upon a time in Hollywood. More, you haven't even, seen that yet? No, I'm. I mean, I'll see it. I I have my. I mean, uh, Tarantino has made like has a thing about making nine movies. Yeah. Right. And he's only going to make nine movies. I'm like, you could make a lot more and maybe more of them would be good. You know, <laughs> maybe you should make more and they'll be better. Because the hateful eight. Meh. Yeah, that's such a good point. 
I think they were filming that when I first moved here. But um, my uncle's obsessed with that movie when they came to L.A. and he wanted to go to all the locations. Yeah. Like we went to Musso and Frank's. But wait, which one? The Hollywood one? one? Uh, Hollywood. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 it looks good. I, I'm, I have no problem with it. I mean, the idea of Leo and, and uh, Brad Pitt, the idea of these guys. Slowly, I think we're getting past where like, we're just like taking for granted that these guys are good people but <laughs> yeah questionable did you see the new top gun no no you're the only one i'm not i i i don't like movies that are pro-military like that it's interesting i am not going to proselytize about it but i did see it uh-huh it was like the first time i've been in a movie theater in years even before the pandemic but it was interesting how it was sort of stateless it yeah, is but where did, they, where did they get the where did they get all that gear? You know, the the military doesn't give. But it you wasn't rah rah America. I was surprised. Yeah, by that. and I wonder if that's just so it will do well globally. But probably. Yeah. But no, actually, that's a good point. I never thought of that. But yeah, I mean, like miss like all, all of the Marvel movies are just basically like yo, mm. let's uh let's all sign up. Yeah. <laughs> but my well, I was explaining to my brothers. Who haven't seen it yet? We, we watch the first one all the time, which yeah, yeah. is yeah. Um, but it's interesting how speaking of these stars like Tom Cruise, it was interesting to see how they literally like the opening scene. I'm giving away things if you haven't seen it. Was almost frame by frame the exactly yeah. the same. So there's like this mix of nostalgia, which really worked. I felt so manipulated but comforted mm-hmm. at the same time. And then there were like actual like like they replayed this the volleyball scene only with a different you know it's just cheap in a way so weird so weird but then really tom cruise's character like you know relating to brad pitt he's like 60 now and in some ways i, I the more i thought about it i think it's like a boomer narrative in some ways he's like a young maybe cusp boomer gen x mm. um but it's all about him not being able to like he's still the only one who can do the job oh so he flies yeah, he's not like and he's a, really a, the only one. And like, oh, it's, there's the whole new Top Gun recruits who are all great, young and yeah. scrappy. But I think it's propaganda to make us feel better about fucking Joe Biden. So if we can, have, if we can have Top Gun, <laughs> maybe if, he, if he's still Maverick, Jesus, that is fucking crazy. He's pushing sixty, right? He's sixty. I he's think. sixty, and he's fucking flying planes. But I thought it really reminds me of like. Does the he whole... play a sixty-year-old? Because he's young. He looks young enough to play like a forty-year-old. But even then, like fucking Maverick. They don't mention he's sixty, but he's clearly retired. They pull him out of uh... retirement for this special mission that only he can sort of train these people to do. So it's the cliche that that uh, the trope that what's it called Fifth Element played on was like yeah you're the only man for the job <laughs> yeah he's the only one out of all of the navy pilots um and then in the end he kind of goes rogue and does it himself <laughs> like it's a little disturbing so it's like fucking vigil dude this is like, like it's it's about war crimes it's what it sounds like yeah but also i feel like it's a boomer. i feel a little bit um you know bitter about the boomers who won't leave their tenure track academic jobs oh, yeah. you know what i mean they yeah. just felt a little bit like that too yeah yeah no i mean like i wish there was uh more of an opportunity for younger blood to not have to fall in line with nancy pelosi like, i think you're totally right about a political sense yeah who would have thought we would get joe biden like we had a crop of people and we got <laughs> the oldest boomer of all yeah we can we can talk politics but let's transition into your topics <laughs> before we get carried away in that do you, so did you have something that you wanted to talk well, about well it relates to all this but okay that's fine my favorite thing to talk about and anyone who listens to this will roll their eyes is i am a big fan of john Berger's ways of seeing do you know this it was a bbc series in the 60s no 70s, i have not no and there was also a book um no i've i've tried to I, I scanned through the object stairs back, the, you know, in praise of shadows, all the little books that I read yeah. when I was in college, but it's, I don't think that I've read that one. It's an interesting book. Is it, um, I just thought it was interesting to talk about too, because it's sort of the core ethos, I think around my work. Mm-hmm. And then I also just feel like it's endlessly renewed in its relevance. Um, but it essentially, he talks about the or uh, the the separation of oil painting from the context that a, or painting in general from the context it originally had which was mostly religious and you know you grew up in mm. rome you you went into a church and you saw why, why i'm so into comic books 
Yeah. Is that is that story frame uh, frame book narrative, yeah. Yeah, oh that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. A lot of, and and you know, one of the things that's cool about like comics is that how many or versions of the same origin story do you have? Yeah. How many of the versions of the same story? Like yeah. a lot of times you have like, you know, uh how many times have you seen Martha <laughs> Martha Wayne die, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so so it's interesting because that's kind of the same thing with like these religious paintings where they did enunciations and mm -hmm. shit like that. You know, it's uh, it's iterative and the context. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it was easier to make work back then because you the topic was picked for you, exactly. the subject matter, <laughs> and all and and the pursuit was to just like make it look real. Exactly, and it and they got better and better and better. Back yeah. to Tarantino. Yeah, like, yeah. The more you do it, you get better. <laughs> yeah, maybe fuck. you should make more. <laughs> Tarantino. Um, yeah, and. <laughs> But yeah, there was some, there was like a clear value system, even though it's, you know, cap patriarchal and potentially problematic in a lot of ways. But you're right. It, you knew where that painting belonged because it was, mm -hmm. it was built for that space. You saw it there. And when you went there, you knew what your role was with that painting. And it was education because not everybody was literate. Right. It was really, yeah, it was a value system communicated through um, images, not words. Absolutely. All those things. And so then... What I think so then he talks about the decontextualization, which sort of happens around the time where, where capitalism and democracy are born, mm -hmm. and he links them, and I think they are inextricably linked. Um, capitalism that, and democracy. Oh yeah, and I put that in air quotes. I think that's an interesting thing. Well, I think especially America as an experiment as a the mm -hmm. first democracy, which is really rooted in capitalism. I still don't feel like we have a democracy, but I no, get what you're I saying. No, I say democracy <laughs> in air quotes. <laughs> I recently saw somebody, so, a, a meme that was like, uh, that, this, uh, that, that basically representative democracy is just not something you can turn around to help you. You know, mm. like it's, it's a tool of oppression and it's not actually going to resolve anything, but it gives you the illusion that you're doing something. Yes, and this relates to ways of seeing. He talks about mystification, which is mm -hmm. he's taking it from Marx, so loosely sort of defined um, within the realm of oil painting. Mystification is sort of misrepresenting something so that um, the proletariat feels like they have power, but it actually mm -hmm. preserves the status quo, which is by a you know small minority. Yeah. Um, but it's an interesting way of looking at art history because I think there is, and I, I taught community college for years, and this is why I know this book so well, because it ended up just being relevant to a lot of the classes I taught. But there's a suspicion I would often see about non-art students in my class, like, oh, uh, mm -hmm. artists, you know, just making millions, just making millions. And what they're, they're legitimately angry about a system, but it's not about the artists, really. It's about the system. And that yeah. system may be this democratic, it's not working and we're frustrated, but it's elucidated through an oil painting. So it gets decontextualized from the context when you have a newly minted, um, you know, no longer do we have people who were indentured servants or, or we did have it, but people suddenly there was a class mobility created by cap by capitalism, mm -hmm. by trade, by exploration, by colonization. And they needed what era were we talking? We're about? talking like 1500s. Okay. When were the when was the Black Plague? Do you know? When was the what? The Black Plague. That was in the 13, 1400s. 13, 1400s. Okay. So you because that's when the middle class blows up, right? Yeah. Like uh, originally, because people were dying at such a rate that your inheritance would be the inheritance of six different people that had nothing, but oh, that's all of a sudden it would all get accumulated. Yeah. And then all of a sudden people could like, but this was this sounds like this is before. You're talking more like uh, uh, industrial revolution. No, before the Industrial Revolution, but like once people can could once we were able to create maps and stable enough ships to go colonize. Okay, that changes the world, as you know. Then we can go uh, exploit resources from other people. And not that you would know, but a good question, and that it just to openly rhetorically ask is, when did fuck it, like when when is the dividing line of capitalism versus just merchantile? You know, like hmm. you know, like that. I I don't know because as a as an actual. Because I, I, I kind of think, I, I associate it with industrialization, but I might be wrong. Because I think, hmm. I think there was probably, you know, in the Old West, the ideas of monopoly and like yeah. maybe the, the scale of the capital is smaller. But, you know, and you could also argue that the Medici are fucking <laughs> I raw think, capitalists. I feel like the slave trade created capitalism in some okay, ways that too, makes sense because, because the roots yeah. of capitalism are profit above all else, right? Yeah. And cheap labor or yeah, yeah. labor that costs nothing. 
Um, and once you had that and you were able to go places and that's how America is founded, those are the roots of it. Yeah. Like, but, um, so then you, you needed, so the suddenly people who, you know, especially in a system that you had in the UK where you were sort of determined by birth, your social status, suddenly if you're willing to travel and colonize. There was social mobility. And then I, it's an interesting way of thinking about seeing and being seen. What, so I'm not sure how alienated people felt when they saw religious iconography because you knew you were a subject to this system. And maybe there was community. Maybe it was comforting. But there was something about um, maybe the haves and the have-nots or something. But oil painting suddenly gets decontextualized because you need to show off what you now have. And so people start, it becomes very secular um, and also at the same time, technology and advancements, you, you could paint things far more realistically. People have been practicing mm. the invention uh, when they figured out how to mix oil with a medium. You could do far more with that than you could with tempera or yeah, the yeah, other yeah. paints they were using. So suddenly painting almost becomes an advertisement of this new, this new social mobility. Mm. And so he talks about, um, so you see paintings of slaves even, you see livestock, you see- Wait, wait paintings- of slaves as a subject or paintings by slaves? No, oh, okay. of slaves as a subject. Okay. Um, and people, with, it's, it's just an interesting book. So he, oh, so it's like it's like the old flex paintings, but like modernized where they're flexing how how much yeah. cattle they have and how much human it, chattel. Totally. Like, yeah, or I don't so, know, that sounded weird. But like, yeah. you know, like treating human as channels. Yeah. 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 So you go and you see those property. The, those parts of go to the Louvre or go to the Met or, and you see those yeah. paintings and it's them in front of a house and mm. it becomes almost a standardized advertisement and pose even of values around gender, around hierarchy, around class, taste. Anyway, it becomes a whole new visual language. And then um, so he he talks about it almost being and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's almost like art gets sort of hijacked for a minute there. I think it always does. Yeah. Yeah. And then is momentarily freed when the, f when the camera is born because mm -hmm. suddenly you can now do that. You yeah, can yeah, capture yeah. things that way. But the, oh, you mean it was burdened by the, by the lack of a camera. It was, it was pigeonholed into. You needed some way to photo realistically show yeah. off your stuff and your status and it provided income for artists, but they didn't control the subject matter. Mm hmm. Oh, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. Like Hans Holbein was like the court painter for Henry VIII. And... When do you think people, or maybe that's where you're headed? But yeah. when did people start choosing their own subject matter? So then I think it really is the clincher is when the camera's born, so the late 1800s or early 1800s, and um, so he argues that advertising, the 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 visual sort of vernacular of advertising, he he poses in that book. I wish I had examples of. It's like okay. almost the same kind of poses that you'll see like in an ad for, um, you know, like a stock brokerage or anything. Mm. It's like, yeah, 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 you yeah. Know, this like arms akimbo kind of thing. So the camera and the, the vernacular of oil painting becomes the vernacular of advertising and the camera becomes the substitute for oil painting. At the same time, you've got the Industrial Revolution. So that's also what bears the camera technology. Yeah, yeah. But then you also can industrialize paint materials and so you get cheap 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 paint so it's i don't think it's any accident that you see impression impressionism rising in the late 1800s 1900s early 1900s and then it explodes into abstraction by the middle of the century did you know um deborah bros mm -mm. Do, or, do you know her she, okay so she was the director uh, or she i mean she's still in Monta Vista, i and she's still acting director i think she's trying to get <laughs> get yeah. that off to someone else she's in seattle now but oh. um Oh, I forgot why I brought her up. Oh, so I was at her going away party and there was this guy there. I don't know who he was, but he was saying something really interesting, which I've heard before. Yeah. Which is that the CIA was using yeah. abstraction. Okay. Do you know anything about this? Mm -hmm. Can you speak on this? I don't know. That okay. I... Then, then I'll try to bu do my yeah. butchered version. Yeah. If you knew, if you knew more, I was going to hand it off to you. Yeah. But basically the, the idea being that the CIA was heavily involved in promoting a a abstract mm. expressionism. And it seems like you're t like what you're talking about is ties into this because what they were saying was that look at the freedom that we have. It's freedom of expression. That uh -huh. was the that was the beacon, the advertising yeah. for America that and that's why CIA got into that. I've also I don't know if anyone has heard this before, or has the details. <laughs> if you can send me stuff on Susan Sontag being involved with the CIA, what? because I've heard that what? shit. I don't know. 
but she is such an important thinker in the art world, which is fascinating to to, Susan to hear. Yeah, I don't know. What we what did you hear? I don't know. I just heard that she's a C, like you know like passive aggressively, and I was like, really? So if anybody CIA knows CIA operative, not an operative, but CIA contact or some some shit, mm. some something that you wouldn't expect from a mm. critical thinker like her, mm. where you're like, oh, you were like. Maybe it's all, not all nefarious. I'm not an apologist no. for the CIA at all, but uh, or maybe she just didn't. You know, yeah. like I think a lot of people just get duped, like mm. by them. Oh, they didn't know. It's yeah. it's it's like the uh, the what's it called? Um, back in the day, where where or like in the uh, UFO community, everybody calls each other a, like a, U, a CIA plant. <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, don't listen. And it, I think also in the... It's because it's the naysayer that's like, no. No, it's like, it's what they do is they have disagreements. And instead of agreeing that to disagree, they'll just be like, oh, that guy thinks that because he's a CIA plant and he's spreading misinformation and shit like that. So it's funny. I don't know. That's I, hilarious. Yeah. Is that why we can't get the truth? Because it's just... Oh, dude, of- <laughs> we can't get the truth because we're... I mean, you know, you, <laughs> you seem... I, yeah. I'm getting a very, I'm not a liberal v- uh, vibe from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but not a Republican either. I, we're, we're to the other side of it, of, of the liberal, right? Like to the left of them. To the left of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah liberal's a bad word now, isn't it? Uh, not to everybody. A lot of people are very, 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 very proud. I was mm. at, I was at uh, an opening at the Bendix recently. And someone was like, well, I consider myself pretty liberal. And I laughed. And I don't I, think real liberals are saying that anymore. They're saying progressive, right? Yeah. I, but I think that there's a lot of people that are liberal that are just hobbyists oh, in, in terms, really, of, in, yeah, in terms yeah, of their yeah, yeah. like political affiliation. You know, like they came out when Trump came out. And I, that's not to bash the person I had a, a disagreement with. It's just funny to me. Like, I feel like liberal is maybe the most sheltered in terms of. Mm. Uh, uh, and um, bubbled in terms of like exposure to outside to ideas that challenge you whereas i feel i feel like Mm. just talking to you already even the way that you talk about maverick and that movie like i got a sense that there's like that you're like maybe i feel like if you are somebody that thinks for yourself you're probably not going to agree with most people or probably not going to agree with a lot of people you're going to come into areas of disagreement and you just get used to it. I've gotten a lot of Facebook fights about politics. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm not on there anymore. Though. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was all Facebook was good for. Yeah. For a minute. Oh, it was horrible. But yeah. Yeah. And then when mm. Facebook started like uh, blocking people, like, you know, yeah. canceling people for, for being anti imperialist, yeah. that shit was crazy. I was like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. politics is like your 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 mainstay like you wouldn't if it wasn't for people getting triggered and going on Mm -hmm. rants but yeah it it was i feel so naive saying for a minute there i thought oh we can actually debate this stuff um and it sort of relates back to burger because he sort of says like fast forwarding really quick like um so yeah if painting's freed and then and then you see this sort of that's where painting i mean in some ways it make i like the idea of thinking that it becomes like impressionism already is very subjective yeah yeah. um and then becomes just you know pollock by the middle of the century and then Mm. and then in so many ways so many possibilities at this point but then advertising taking the place for um dictating social norms and hierarchies and it's very much i feel like our cultural vernacular um is advertising oh yeah so um and he talks about you know it creates this d- dichotomy that hasn't changed even since religious iconography of who's seen and who isn't and and you get used to being invisible and so I, at that moment when social i burger i don't think was around when social media was born but i was so curious what he would have thought because i think mm. it was this moment and we're still in it where we thought we could be seen and heard and maybe so you know, and it what, just turned out to be another side. <laughs> just, we're just actually overwhelmed and silenced. Yeah, <laughs> you you know that uh, I I need to I keep saying this on the show, but I need to actually get the details on what what was passed that changed this. But yeah, it used to be that we could only propagandize externally to other countries, and we couldn't uh, propagandize our own population. Uh, but since 2011, Obama made it so that you can. Wait, you don't think we've had propaganda before that? I think that we had, uh, I think that's a good point. I think that the way that they used to do it was through going through foreign countries. They would plant stories in old in newspapers 
over there, right? Mm-hmm. And then over here, people would pick up that story, and that's how the propaganda was w- would reach over here. I see. We, but what it, specifically what we have that's overt is like Radio Free Europe and shit like that, right? Mm-hmm. And like Radio Mambi, which is like a yeah. CIA funded uh, Cuban p- propaganda station. Uh huh. Um, and and so what's new now is that you have people like I think Jake Tapper or no who is it who was the one that was it like we literally have a guy running for Congress right now in the country I forget where it is that is bragging about being former intelligence that is new you know it's like Tucker Carlson running he's yeah he's state media yeah basically. yeah yeah no he is and it, I mean actually Tucker is interesting because. He is like, aside from Joe Rogan, he's the second most popular Mm -hmm. like presenter. But it's like Rogan's at eleven million a month, Mm. and he's at like three million a month. Mm. And so it is crazy to me. But um, but yeah, like uh, three million, and that's when I occasionally will pop onto Facebook. It's just my parents' friends quoting Tucker Carlson. No, and and Democrats like sixty percent of Democrats watch that shit. What? Yeah, yeah. So he's, but he's the only one that has left voices. Like he has Aaron Mate on. Mm-hmm. He's the he's the only person. He's spewing this truth. Like no, he's a fucking. It's, he's he's the same as Rachel Maddow. They're the same fucking. You know, yeah. they both have been sued and both have had to say in court that it is expected that the public yeah. has a reasonable expectation that he's not going to tell the truth. Like mm. the same thing with like a, a, every corporate media person has been sued over this, and then Facebook. With their with their fact checking shit, they mm. were they were like, oh yeah, we had to acknowledge that it was just someone's that our fact check are mm. just opinions. They're not actually wow. fact checks. Yeah, that depresses me because I think we call that we've we've watched that the idea of news become eroded. That's opinion. It's all, and what do you mean? Oh, uh, oh yeah, all of that shit is opinion. And now it's become. Um, we were just confused about it, and now it's. Yeah, I feel like with Turco, I don't watch. Rage. I don't watch any cable news because I think no. it's. Just what do you trash. watch? I don't really watch that much. I. But was... you seem pretty informed overall. Do you just mm. read a, a bunch of interesting old stuff about American history? I don't know where I get my news anymore. I'm overwhelmed, which is exactly Burger's point too. That at some point, you get overwhelmed by things being sold to you that you just yeah. end up not doing anything. But I used to read the New York Times all the time, and my brother is actually at the Washington Post, so I have a little bit of a bias there. Yeah. You saw, <laughs> you saw the, the, the guy that wrote the story about how there was a guy in the Washington Post who was like, hey, man, chill it out. Biden, and Biden, all presidents have to deal with like dictators, right? And he was basically saying oh, that the Saudi, yeah, w- 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 the the Khashoggi thing, yeah. And he was saying that uh, Mohammed bin Salman wasn't that bad of a guy, and mm. and then and then someone pointed out like, yeah, the guy that fucking butchered your colleague that works at exactly the same paper. <laughs> so yeah, that's depressing. And also, we can change the subject. Let's go back to art. <laughs> no, I, I, this is all part of it. I okay. think. Um, yeah, the Saudi connection is capitalism. It's like the Carl Carlyle group, like mm-hmm. 9-11, yeah. Saudi operation, right? Yeah, yeah. And they were all, fl- the, everyone was flown out. Of, there's no way there will be justice or democracy against, they're just too powerful. Yeah, I'm ha- I mean, I'm very comfortable just being like, that shit is fishy and I have no idea what happened, but the connections to Saudi Arabia are definitely there. Like you can't yeah. fucking deny that. I'm not. I'm. I'm trying to make sure that people understand we're not a truther podcast, and that you you don't seem to be a truther. But I definitely don't. I definitely know. No, that. I'm not a. Tr- I don't even think that's a. That's that's verifiable information. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They were the. They were all Saudi. No. Like no. No. Exactly. Was a Saudi. I'm not exactly. saying anything that's not. No. I'm just making sure that people like that the oh, libs yeah, yeah, that yeah, watch yeah. the show don't go like, oh, no. this is fucking crazy because I want you libs here. I want you learning. <laughs> Okay. And hey, I'm not an anarchist, and I'm. I just want to clarify. I'm, 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 I'm not, not an anarchist. I'm not a libertarian either. I'm just the antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I am too. I'm sure members of my family think that. But yeah. really, oh, let's go no. into the the, the, oh, the, the saucy stuff. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, were you raised Catholic? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, you can tell. I think it's pretty I, yeah, easy to pick like up. I feel like we can smell it on yeah, fellow yeah. recovering Catholics. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, you can, you can see the the subtle guilt. Yeah, 
that just sits there as the baseline. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a baseline, yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's where I'm the introverts. I don't believe yeah. in that anymore. No, yeah. I mean, I don't even bother. I don't even like spend time thinking that I don't believe it. I just don't yeah. think about it. No, I don't either until <laughs> yeah. I talk about it with a family member. But I had a funny, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but it's like my favorite story. I think the last time I went to mass was Christmas, like, maybe five or six years ago my younger brother was there and i think he was stoned mm. that's how he was able to go we were doing it for our mom and we, we were listening to the homily or the um gospel which is all about mary's body being you know this virginal uh, you know the story everybody and my <laughs> brother looks over and goes what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> Like finally heard it for the first time. This is so fucked up. <laughs> and that's yeah. But it's a story. It's an ideology. But my favorite story that about that is there's a book called Louisiana Power and Light, and there's a story of the Immaculate Conception. It's about a family of like fucking losers that just have the worst luck that kind yeah. of buy into the fact that they're losers and continue to perpetuate. Just right, give in to their loserdom. Yeah, it's and it's it, it's actually really good and not as sad as you think. It's just really yeah. interesting, uh, and it's not like pitying. It's just yeah. kind of like, oh, what the fuck. But one of the stories in it is there were people watching the Civil War as it was happening. This is like in his lineage of incompetent family members, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or like of shithead family members. And it's the story of Immaculate Conception, which is, uh somebody's nutsack gets hit with a bullet and then it ends up going into her belly and it like somehow the sperm gets into her like that. <laughs> so immaculate that conception. like an 11 year old boy <laughs> made that up for sure. Yeah. Immaculate conception is real. It happened in this fiction book that I've been telling you about. <laughs> you guys, it's real. <laughs> it happened in a fiction book. <laughs> so tell, so were you, were, were, did you like, I went, I at least had the good fortune of going to Catholic uh, like being a Catholic in Italy where I saw how Catholics actually cath- were Catholic. What's that like? Oh, uh, they just fuck all the time. You see cos- condoms yeah, it's everywhere. Like, it's like premarital sex, condoms. It's like that's a culture that's all about pleasure, not shame. Yeah, no, there's like, like literally you would just walk past like spots where you could tell a car had been parked and there were condoms on the floor. Like so, they're, they're makeout spots. Like that shit is like, mm. No, so no, yeah, we've got... Well, the, the, the it's puritanical origins of this country. It's the loophole religion. So, yeah. like, you can just be the sorry. <laughs> you can you just can be sorry. You can in Judaism, too. Just yeah. do a mitzvah. Yeah. Well, there's no hell in, in Judaism, is mm-hmm. it? It's the religion. If you're really going to go for it, go yeah. for Judaism. Yeah. It seems, it seems like it can be kind of laissez faire, which is so crazy because why are people so committed to destroying them? Yeah. <laughs> it's like the, the cultural most, part of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's the most, like, chill, like, Hey, maybe this way, maybe it's not. And yeah, and we're not trying to recruit you, but you can join us if you want. We're not going to proselytize. Yeah. I don't know. But I guess that Italy has the the patriarchal part of it as a country, but. Oh, Italy's like fucking, you're going to get groped. Yeah. So to be a woman there, it's not easy. Yeah. I guess. Um, But that's interesting, the view of Catholicism. I was in public school until fifth grade and then Catholic school from then on. Mm. So like they really wanted to make you like a bad kid. <laughs> Wait, did did, did right. you did you act up out after at Catholic school? You weren't like the traditional one? Uh cuz let I'm, me let me tell you. The girls on Hinge that say that they're Catholic? <laughs> the worst ones, huh? No, not not worse, just adventurous. Oh. <laughs> I wouldn't say I was, you know, saint like at all. Okay. Um, I don't know. My brother went all the way through K through uh, oh my God. college. I think, I mean, because Catholic schools in so many ways, especially like in countries like Ireland are like, like almost like social service agencies. Oh, really? Yeah. Like you send your, like they have to keep it secular enough so that non-Catholics will go there or feel like they Wait, can. but you were, you were going to school out here in the U.S., Yeah, right? but like, okay. that, I don't know that everyone in our school was Catholic. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that you that's know like, mean? yeah. But, you know, it was... Which is like a special kind of fucking torture. If you're like parents are Hindu. (laughs) (laughs) They send you to fucking... (laughs) Yeah. No. I don't know. I think because I had a public school um, basis, 
Yeah. Like then I went to a new school and there were some cool people there. But I remember when I left the public school to do that, everyone was like, wow, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like you're a nerd now. But I don't know. The uniforms kind of sucked. And it was definitely like the boys in high school didn't have we had the girls school and the boys school and the boys had no dress code and we had to wear skirts and they measured mm -hmm. our skirts. Every, you know, just dumb. Measuring stuff. skirts. Let's just it's like, like, really. Why not just make them floor length? Oh, what? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> just that kind of stuff, like appearance focus. But I don't know. I, uh, I don't rem I surprisingly know very little about the Bible, even though I probably had to read it every day. Like, I just think I disassociated and. I was dyslexic, so I got the pass. You got the pass. Yeah. yeah. I was like, no one ever made me fucking read the fucking Bible at all. I'm I just, I just heard pastors talk about it and, and. And I was daydreaming about something else. Yeah. Oh man. I used yeah. to, uh, what did you daydream about? Hmm. Probably like. That's a good question. I got mine locked and loaded. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was like what I got to do the second I was free from school, like go play with my friends or go. Uh, I used to picture John Woo style battles, like Highlander style fights in the church where people like would jump from, the, you know, the second balcony. Wow. And, and then the, the, the crucifix was a sword that you could pull out. That's incredible. In a sheep. Yeah, man, I was bored. <laughs> no, but that's amazing. Yeah. I don't think, I think I just was like in La La Land in my head, imagining other scenarios. So did you, you, you mentioned that Rome was your favorite city. You've been there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and have you been, ever been to, what other cities in Italy have you been? Rome, I ran a marathon in Florence like 15 okay. years ago. So I feel like I really saw it there and I... um associated with a certain amount of physical suffering <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah that sounds yeah rome i've been to rome two or three times florence and then once uh, uh, we went down the amalfi coast after that so oh, it's nice. like portofino good move. And sorrento uh cinque terra what's that cinque terra didn't do that but um went to uh pompeii pompeii, pompeii is fucking crazy that was amazing. That is a very interesting place. Totally fascinated by Pompeii. That's yeah. one of my favorite volcanoes in general. Are one of my favorite subjects too. Not just that; it's the it's the only preserved it's a, a Roman city that I know of. Yeah. Oh, what, is it the know, only one? I mean, to that level, because with the, the color ash, and yeah. the murals and everything. Yeah. 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 The yeah. the that the ash from the volcano kept it intact, mm -hmm. so it was able to be ex excavated. There's other like there's other roman monuments elsewhere but i think as far yeah. as like an entire city i think maybe her colonium is also or no is that the same is that right there yeah 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 but talk about um yeah back to what you're saying like i was surprised by all the graffiti how dirty it was and yeah like it, like those like in the town it was like bar 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 and like naked ladies painted on it and penises yeah. and looked fun oh yeah there's a, it's a very sexual, yeah. sexual society. So interesting to have that in relationship to Catholicism. Yeah. Could bring that back to burger because I think it really, <laughs> how do people exist within these dominant hierarchies? Like you can tune them out after a while, I think to some degree. Yeah. Even if you're subjugated, that's a controversial statement, but most of the time well, culture think, develops in relation in opposition i think there's a d level of subjugation there's a, there are different stages of subjugation and i think that there is a level where you don't notice that you're subjugated yeah and then you all you do is look beneath you and you feel sorry for all the people that are subjugated <laughs> yeah and you think you're powerful yeah that must be a survival mechanism definitely i mean can you imagine being like really well off and having any authority over the lives of people like that is definitely something that I don't think a lot of artists aspire to unless it's like a conceptual thing where they're unless like, Jeff oh, Coons. yeah. <laughs> oh, really? I don't know if he aspires to it, but he's, he has like a factory basically. Why do people j hate Jeff Coons so much? Well, um, why, do you like him? I don't, I, I'm, I've, ne I just realized recently that people hate him. Well, what is your, what's your experience with him? fine it's very well crafted stuff you know like i yeah. mean i don't have like i i'm just trying to see like when people get canceled is it a valid do you think it's a valid cancellation i don't know mm, i don't even know if he's been canceled but he's like disregarded but disregarded. he still makes tons of money yeah i mean i've seen his stuff at uh lacma and the the yeah. the the, uh, the 
Those big aluminum the, things. The balloons are really interesting. I yeah. but I don't I, I don't do you know why people are like so I, anti him? I do think it's like this it's interesting yeah. is the more I interact with people on a certain level. Um you see, I think a lot of people go into art of any kind, whether or not it's making comic strips, like there's a certain amount of protest or agency that you're seeking. And then you realize in the end, the end result is always capitalism. Mm -hmm. It's just unavoidable. Yeah. Um, and I think in some ways he just modeled that really early and um, not even that early. Like the religious painters that we're talking about were all essentially they were told what their subject matter was and they made tons of money and no, and they got, they took bribes to put people in the paintings too. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, it it's, wasn't pure. I don't know if it's ever been pure. Uh, yeah. Oh, so, so it's like a purist thing. Maybe. Do you think that comes from like academia? Cause I, I don't hmm. see people that are out uh, like that don't have their MFAs getting that up, the you know, up in arms about this shit. No, I think he is really accessible to people outside the art world. Oh, is that maybe another thing? Uh, maybe there's snobbery too, but I think, for me, I think it's, I remember he had a retrospective at the Whitney, like, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because it was like the wall text was written by him, like just by an egomaniac. It was mm -hmm. just like, oh, come on. Like, where's the criticality here? You yeah. know? It's like, Jeff Koons, the most important artist in the world, <laughs> <laughs> had this brilliant idea. You know, it's just like comical, but it's also part of the farce of it all. And maybe in the end, he will be... I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, yeah. He is the artist maybe of the capitalist era, especially in the 80s when you had just sort of this um, real deification of, of wealth and ostentatiousness. So it's like when people hit commercial rap? Kind of? Yeah, maybe. You know, like that they just... It feels corrupted. Mm. And I also wonder if people... Um, I don't know, like early stages of pop art, I think felt like Klaus Oldenburg just died and yeah. there was something really, and even with Warhol, it was like he was. But they also hate Warhol. A lot of people shit on Warhol. But I think he did an important thing in the moment. No, but I, I've, I've met boomers, especially that yeah. were of his era that fucking think he's a, a fraud. I, like, it's crazy. I would like, that's what, what oh, that, that was another one. That's why I asked the Jeff Koons questions. I was like, what the fuck? Like, it, it, yeah. what? I thought he was fine. Yeah. <laughs> May, and maybe there are different levels of it, but I think it's because he, everything's so calculated because it, maybe there isn't much struggle, but, but maybe it also just feels like he's. Well, wouldn't it be worse if he was making work about struggle? <laughs> yeah, maybe. But he's got a whole team, like a factory, he has huge production budgets. Like he's got the system working for him, like Gagosian who's, who's, fronts million dollar production budgets and yeah. then they sell them for 10 million. Yeah, but it, you know, at the same time, it's like if he fucking delivers, like what? It, I understand the like. So I'm kind of getting past. Yeah, my my resistance to like like for in I'm 42 in my lifetime I'm never gonna get rid of capitalism. There's never gonna be like there's not in the next few like 50 years let's say that let's give myself like no you know let's give myself 100 years in the next 100 years I cannot. What see do you us. think it'll be? It is definitely in its late stages. It's morphing into something. Oh, I think maybe it's just complete oligarchy again but. yeah i think i think it's going towards feudalism and yeah. and i think that nation states are just becoming prisons mm -hmm. as, as opposed so like you can't you know you're stuck with the cost of living and no job mm -hmm. as opposed to being able to chase mm -hmm. like chase cost of living and shit like that like i would love to live in fucking gentrify mexico and shit like that like yeah. people do you, people are actually doing that shit right now like, yeah in fact, people are buying houses in in Europe because, like, I know. Cause in Italy is so fucking cheap. Yeah, it's crazy. It's a reverse migration, which I think is fascinating. Back to America as a democracy, like we're leaving. There's parity between the dollar and the euro. Yeah, it was stronger for a minute last week. Yeah, yeah, it's so fucking weird. Like what? Yeah, you know. And um, look, I think that the reality is is that if we look at the ambitions of our government. And we're not like including Biden in this because I don't think he's really making decisions. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that like they're just treating us like they treat the rest of the world now. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's interesting. An exploitable resource. Yeah.
They, mm. you, yeah, and, and yeah. So I don't know. I mean, this is getting it to be a bit of a bummer, but <laughs> sorry. But but at, at that time, I'm like, that person. There's a funny New Yorker cartoon. It's like I'm that person. And you're like, hey, here's me again, and then the person's like, Reagan, de- Reagan, destroy the economy. Blah, blah, blah. Like I'm I'm the buzzkill. Sorry, you're the buzzkill. No, I'm also the buzzkill. I've been making a good effort to 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 keep it towards. Uh, me not talking about the same things I was talking about. <laughs> well, I think Coons is an interesting example because I don't know if he if he makes people ha- I, maybe I don't know I can't speak for people. And you're asking a good question, but I think it's because it seems cheap to people. So where is the authenticity? Where's the soul in his work? But on the other hand, it may be that the work that we see that's survived other you know Greek and Roman cultures. And we see soul and authenticity it could be the Kunzes of those eras too, yeah. you know. Um, and in some ways, he is really very much the story of the American experience, economic experience. But for for example, like someone like Boys, who's like yeah. kind of revered at like his story's bullshit too. <laughs> it's complete story. <laughs> it's like completely like fabricated, you know. Yeah. So so it, it's interesting, like that distinction, like maybe we like. The and aesthetics. Boises isn't about beauty or shiny objects. It's about ugliness and like the materials are kind of ugly. And yeah. so maybe we take it more seriously. So there's something that's, that's reflected <laughs> back at us that is kind of dumb. Yeah. Because color and color and scale, like they're big parts of my work. And they're, yeah. they're something, um, it's, it's an interesting, it was another topic I was going to talk about. Yeah. You know, chromophobia. Okay. Which is, this is a great book, if anyone, I also proselytize about this one too. David Bachelor, um, he talks about color and its perception in Western societies versus non-Western and how it sort of relates to, this is also a bus, <laughs> white supremacy. Mm-hmm. But we have this idea that Greek and Roman statuary was white and then white, and it really, it was sort of a Victorian era definition. Um, yeah. And the guy's name was Charles White, not joking, like it could, <laughs> you know, writes itself, but we see that as rational. We see that as um, uh, um, intelligent, academic, like scholarly, academic, scholarly, classic. The classical period, right? You know, the classics, studying the classics. Yes, it's and it's male driven. It's male white tr- male driven, and it's very. Uh, it, it's very. Um, it's. What the fuck? Humanities mixed with science, mixed exactly. with politics. Yes. You know, yeah. all, all, all the pinnacle of civilization. Rational. The Senate and the populace <laughs> of Rome. Senatus the populus. Senate. <laughs> Senatus populus Romanos. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> as PQR. <laughs> or, or as we used to say as the kids. Sono porchi questi romani, which means these, uh, these Romans are, por- are pigs. Oh my God, that's <laughs> but, so funny. Porchi is like... Pig isn't like dirty, not as in cop. <laughs> I love that you can um, you can have slang in uh, Italian. How many languages do you speak? Three: Spanish, English, and Italian. And what's your cultural background? Cuban. Um, well, my cultural, I guess, cultural background would be probably Italian because yeah. that's m- biggest influence. I went back to Miami when I was like eighteen, and yeah. I, I didn't necessarily fully vibe. But then I became Florida man, like I told you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm that Florida man, you guys. <laughs> yeah, man, it's in the water, dude. The water tastes really good, but it makes you weird. <laughs> Florida's weird, yeah. But they do have good water. Yeah, like, it's yeah. Beautiful. I remember. I re- no, I mean, like in the taps. Like oh. I remember people from New York coming and being like, "Damn, the water's really good." And that's here. where the New Yorkers will go retire. So, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's interesting, and the whole discourse around art is always funny to me because. There's different vari- like there's varying degrees. Obviously, yeah. the, I am I am interested in the ideas and stuff, but I don't know. Fortunately- it's also related to boys. Like it's it's also arbitrary and it's also revised all the time. So what I was gonna say really quick is that there's an exhibition at the Met right now which recreates Rome and and Greek strat- statuary with how they would have really looked, which is multicolored. Oh, really chromatic. Where's it? At the Metropolitan in New York. Oh shit! I can't go. Because it's the, in New York. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was a... Um, I was like really... I was like going to go. <laughs> I had, I, well, it kind of relates to Pompeii too. Yeah. There's so much color in, that, in, that, in those murals and those mosaics. Like color as a central sort of um, language that we speak that we're drawn to in a primordial sense even. So it's funny that it's, it, there's an attempt to eradicate it for a minute. Were you trying to read a quote from there? 
I can read a quote if you'd like. Oh, no, I thought you had a quote. You were just showing Oh, I'm just a nerd. I like to have it just in case. Um, Here, I'll read you a quote, though. Um, Forms of chromophobia. So maybe there's a little bit of chromophobia around Jeff Koons, too, is Mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. Oh, It's it's... the bright, shiny object. Yeah, yeah. Um, And so I think it is something. um, I've I've had people come in my studio, and they're like, Oh, it would be so great to see these monochromatic, like oh, fuck off, white. You think, <laughs> wow, it's like telling someone to not speak slang or or yeah. to only speak English. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but the for- only the only feedback I like is when people are like, "These are great. You should make them in painting." Yeah, <laughs> you exactly. should do more. <laughs> you should do more. But it, but it, it, part of the theory about this book is that it's it, color is related to the feminine, to the foreign. So it is sort of rooted in colonialism. So if you look at cultures outside of the of the Westernized world, Western Europe and U- United States, it's color. Yeah. Um. So like Southwest and the t- and uh, uh, even now the Southwest and turquoise is like. <laughs> now I'm making a joke, but I think it is sort of otherwise because that's sort of re- relative to Native Americans. Yeah, no, I was making more of a joke of like when people go to the Southwest and they just try to oh, <laughs> and then they the- come back and they wear it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but no, that is interesting. I think I actually for a long time my my uh, color phobia was more related to wanting to like be uh, being purist about being a drawer. Someone mm. who draws, and I think that like once well, you start, that is part of the argument. The drawing and the line is actually the pure, but that's yeah. different. We're talking about craft, yeah. I guess. Does, um, does color feel more expressionistic? No, I'm now I'm using color, and I'm totally yeah. happy with it. It, it. I think it's just um, it's a whole new like vocabulary to add yeah. color, you mm. know. And so, and there's like there's there's hue, intensity, all these yeah. little th- different things that like add to the word the thing i just mostly did it because i mostly liked to draw in line because that's what i was taught was tr- proper drawing yeah and that like if you start using color and i still kind of buy into it if you use color pencils it's technically painting you know so which is so stupid yeah it's pretty Categories. dumb isn't it funny when you realize the art world's actually kind of conservative or art the art world is so tied up in 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 like like i mean going back to how patriarchal like yeah. the renaissance period was but like all like that's all of those people were studying but they were studying a trade right right it's not they weren't studying like something that is like conceptual or anything like that mm-hmm. they were just learning how to render things yeah and uh and it's interesting you were like, apprentice like michelangelo was an pre- apprentice when he was like 11 yeah he was a tr- and he was paid there was probably a lot of sex involved in apprenticeships too um, i'm i'm guessing yeah I'm just guessing because yeah. it's like the closer you get to Greece, the more okay that shit was. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> of a certain period, Greece, you're cool now. Yeah. Greece, I'm assuming. You're great now. Yeah. I'm assuming. I'm assuming you guys aren't like. Uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah. The well, that's funny though. I think there are purists around drawing for sure. But yeah, there's purists around everything. But yeah. I'm, now I'm just having fun because once you start using Copic markers, all yeah. that puritanical shit goes yeah. away. And then, in fact, I've gone from using Copics to now using acrylic, and now I feel like I'm getting more academically acceptable. You know, like like it's like, wow. uh, but it, but I do want them to be archival, so that's why I'm doing it. You know, capitalism. Oh yeah, no, and that's kind of the turn because I've been conceptual for a really long time. Why does archival matter to you? Because it matters to the customer. Yeah. So yeah, but should things be allowed to fall fall apart? Yeah, I mean, I make stuff like that too. Still, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just want to not fucking starve. <laughs> I know. I completely hear you because a lot of these sculptures are from you know packaging material. They began, and then I, this is where I related to Burger too. That I use. I started this? using. Can I touch this? Yeah, started using styrofoam sort of accidentally in sort of a collage like approach. Which I always thought this was clay. No, I thought it's... it was roughed up clay. Uh. Uh-uh. Maybe cool. clay's next, but um, no, the basis of it is styrofoam, and now I've sort of now they've become archival, I suppose. I don't know how archival they are, but they're definitely not biodegradable. <laughs> they're definitely not biodegradable, but in terms of longevity, I think <laughs> no, they I'm have kidding. It now. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, longevity already, but um, the surfaces are now they were these ones over here were actually almost like paper mache, yeah, sculptor mold. And now I'm using hydrocal, which is plaster with cement as the coating outside, mm-hmm. cool. But it's interesting because I, I feel like that's also back to burger. Like 
what what is his central thesis is you know what is in a capitalist society um take take the vernacular of art separately art itself as a commodity to buy and sell he's mm. really sort of arguing for how it's there is really no pure exchange it's almost impossible to find yeah and we were kind of talking about that because even your impetus to make something in a certain way or with a certain material may be pure but in the end you want to make a living right yeah yeah um and that's i'm not saying that's an escapable reality ever but um uh, but it's it's so what is the what is the response in a democrat in a capitalist society? He's a, it, one that our primary vernacular is around consumerism and advertising. The answer is to shop, mm. and he that's sort of the conclusion of that book is that that's why we have voting rates that are so low because we've consumed purchasing power with actual power, mm. and we've left the rest. You know, we've yeah. sort of ceded our authority, our voting authority, and I wonder where we are with that now. Voting rates are still pretty low, but um, but I think I don't know. I know it might not seem like it when you see this colorful work, but I think there's so much anxiety about all of this. Yeah, and the I, I, the burger thing I was saying about styrofoam, it's like it feels like art. Um, another sort of medium that comes from the 20th century and from mass production, and from the where capitalism is taking us, is making things from that which is around us. And so there's agency in that, but, um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, it's grim for sure. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it like, it's almost like I want to change the subject because it is so pointless to talk about electoral politics to me at this point, like that, like, it's really just the only reason we have these conversations at this point is so that people know where you stand. You're never going to change someone's mind. No, you you know, you like, and I'm, I'm okay with like people, believe it. like everybody thinks something different than me yeah because i like because most people most people i hang out with make their own decisions and when people yeah. make their own decisions they make their own conclusions it's not a cookie cutter thing not right. everybody's going to agree on everything i it's sad to me though that we're all sort of we're all retreating to our corners on some level maybe we were there already to some degree but um it is if like you said like the or you didn't say it this way but it does feel like a long time ago, Democrats gave up on the social contract, and now we're just seeing that, like you, I don't remember how you phrased it, like we're treating us the way they treat the rest of the world. Um, let's see, I mean, there's bare minimum infrastructure stuff happening. It's just, I mean, we're queuing for like, I think we're like fifty billion to fucking a war. Yeah, that has nothing to do with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we can't cancel student loan debt. Yeah. And, and the, all of the fucking and uh, 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 African nations are trying are, are staying neutral in this because they're so annoyed with yeah. what we, we are fucking the world. We are fucking Japan. Yeah. Japan is struggling. Everybody. Europe is like we are being belligerents here. Mm. I don't care. This motherfucker invaded. I am not Russian. I don't mm. speak to what that dude, dude does. I speak to what we do. And given weapons to keep these fucking untrained Ukrainians fighting this yeah. this war and they constantly having to retreat it's crazy it was really surreal to watch that play out in real time like we knew it was going to happen we knew it was going to happen and then just, and it just happened and it yeah. happened and then it was like shocking i mean i know i sound naive but to watch it in real time probably the way vietnam felt for people seeing it on tv and then and then watching the cycle of it be normalized and forgotten and then we're just pumping money into it yeah, and just like the sanctimoniousness of like, oh my God, we got to save these white people. I mean, right. it's all oh, there. Oh yeah, did you hear all that? Like, it's all there. The it, CBS reporter yeah. who was like, these are civilized people. And they were showing clips from Syria to like yeah. manipulate people as if they were, like mm. there was that one clip of the girl yelling at the Israeli soldier. Actually, that wasn't even Syria. That was in Israel. That was Israel, yeah. You know, like it's crazy. It, 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 it that like that's why I like the art space. It's like, it's a yeah. nice little <laughs> cocoon of almost utility it's almost futile but it's uh but it's important have? Yeah. yeah it's i mean i don't think that you, i get the sense that you're probably the kind of person that could probably be very sad if you stopped making work oh i don't it's the only thing like sounds cliche but it's like keeps me going yeah as i'm like dating on hinge i'm realizing like <laughs> i don't have a lot to talk about to other to people that don't have any you know if you're like a fucking accountant like I yeah. will probably not know what to ask you about. If you're an artist, I'll be like, hey, <laughs> yeah. why, why does everyone hate Jason, Jeff Koons? It's fun to think about Jeff Koons in that regard, because I think 
I feel like we're looking backwards on on an era of America that doesn't exist when you look at Jeff Koons. And so I don't know if people hate him as much anymore. But mm -hmm. I do think that Whitney retrospective was funny in hindsight because it is in some ways sort of it's almost like a um, funny lampoon of the art world. Like and back to Burger, he also mm -hmm. talks about like wall text and museums being sort of like basically palaces you're allowed to walk in like they're there's there's so much little critical thinking going on in terms of what you see it's about hierarchies and social status and people preserving investments you know and then the wall text tells you what to think about it you know it's ridiculous and in some ways that's what coons is lampooning yeah yeah. you're making me say nice things about coons i think sometimes coons i um I just get it's just bored really fast like it's yeah, a shiny I mean... object that loses its luster fast but but there is something about it that, yeah, it is part of our consciousness. The it's it's yeah. You know, anyway. I don't think it's always. I mean, I think, I think also what's interesting is that like, right now there is sort of this acknowledgement that kitsch is no longer yeah uh, taboo or 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 a lesser yeah lesser art form. But you have an artist that kind of does some kitschy stuff. Like yeah. the dogs are definitely kitsch. The Michael yeah. Jackson shit. It's all yeah. pop culture references, right? Like the Michael yeah. Jackson sculpture. Making them, elevating them as if they're... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it's it's also interesting that like that balance of like, well, yeah. is kitsch okay? Or is it is it only okay when like poor people do it? Or right? when, does, when is kitsch, when is it like, because it does seem like there's still a place where like it just is, is, is gauche mm. or in bad taste. Yeah. But a white man does it. And then it's subversive, I guess. Yeah. I, or I, I mean, I don't even know that his work is that subversive. Maybe the porn stuff was. Yeah. Or exploitative. I don't know. But. Um, I'm not even that well versed on Coons now I'm realizing because I don't know. I just think that I just recommend. I wonder what the catalog is like for that show. It was funny, but it's not. I, I think it is. If you're talking about the art world, we're talking about making things archival. In some ways, we're doing the same stuff, you know. We have to like mythologize ourselves to get people to buy our work or to show our work. Yeah. But how and you do that on Instagram. We participate in that economy all the time. Well, it's like people always want me or they don't want me, but there are people that have very strong opinions about Joe Rogan. Yeah. And I find them really entertaining to me. Yeah. Because it's usually from people that have never watched or don't know anything. They've only heard about who Joe Rogan is, what yeah. his show is about yeah. and all of that. And to me, as someone who like this is my fucking industry that I'm trying really hard to get into, yeah, I'm gonna know about the biggest name in all of fucking media. Like, there's no one bigger than Joe Rogan right now. There's literally no one yeah. anywhere. Nothing does eight million a month listeners. Nothing come close to it. So to me, I'm like, okay, it's not necessarily show this for me. What does he talk about? I haven't listened. Yeah, it's, I mean, he has people, like, he has people that I'm just not interested in a lot of the time, like Jordan mm. Peterson, Lex Friedman, mm -hmm. all these fucking kind of libertarian-y, right-wingy guys. Yeah. But, like, so people think that he's a right-winger. He's actually, like, he was, He said that recently, I heard, and he's like, I didn't vote for Trump, or I don't yeah, even care yeah. about Trump. Yeah. So, to me, it's interesting. I feel like Coons falls into that same category yeah. of it's, like, yeah, he's a hustler in our industry, and it, yeah. you can at least learn something from what he's doing. And th that was what I—that I, was part of the wall text of his show that he began as a stockbroker. Mm. So he, he and that's where I do think in the '80s he very much is a representation of the Reagan era in so many ways. Yeah. Um, that he just applied that principle to an art model, and he—he he was right. It worked. Yeah, maybe that's what's irritating. <laughs> maybe that's what's irritating. Do you do you feel of, do you consider yourself like someone who's trying to have some level of commercial success? Are you yeah. trying to sell work? Yeah, I have been. Okay, because yeah. your pieces are pretty big. So yeah. so I so I don't. You feel like that's hard to sell? No, I don't. I don't. I usually associate smaller pieces with somebody that's trying to sell. Oh, uh, hmm. but but I have small pieces too. No, no, I'm not. This is not at all a judgment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, and, and this I'm getting is, defensive. I have a uh, wide variety of products. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I, I, first of all, you're on the show because I love your stuff. Okay, Aww. so it's not even. But no, you're right about diversifying for sure. Well, no, I'm just, I'm just wondering uh, how that process goes for you because I mean that's definitely something that's an interest to me. It's interesting because I think scale really matters. That's 
like this piece I have going, it's in process, this white piece, which I'm pointing at something people can't see, but um, uh, because they come from sort of a collage approach with material that's, you know, detritus, really. Mm -hmm. There isn't a longevity associated with them, but people are really, I like the fact that they become something huge and towering, but everyone, they're commercially interested in, but they want them outside in their backyard mm. or on their beach house mm -hmm. in the Hamptons, and they're just, so I'm in sort of a, well, you got a good market there. It's shit. You, yeah, but these are. The I couldn't have a paper mache so, styrofoam all piece. Right. I will. I will pay and take a cut. Now I'm all <laughs> Jeff Koons. I'll take. I'll, I'll pay and take a cut of whatever ceramic version you make. <laughs> I think it would be nice to do them in metal. So in I, metal. Okay. Do you know how to weld? Oh, I'm not gonna do that. Oh, that okay. I would pay someone to do probably. Okay. So I guess I am in that. That I, I feel like I'm in a little bit of an in between space where I know a uh, really good welder. Okay. Cool. Uh, Jackie Perez. All right, Jackie, I'll be calling you. Yeah, I'll hook you guys up. But it puts me uh, very much in that Kunzian place where, and Ruby, my studio mate, she's made. She just made this fantastic. It's been dismantled. You see the clay pieces in the. Um, driveway she made this enormous clay piece in clay that became a model that something's gonna be fabricated in bronze for mm. the next show and we were talking about how much that would cost and she's like i wouldn't be able to do any of this without the support i have from my gallery yeah yeah so in some ways it's not even about it's it's, it's being you know we live in an economy that does still as an artist require patronage and so um I think it's good. I do think I've been thinking more and more about um, diversifying the work that I make so that mm -hmm. I can, so there is a range of things because I do want my work in the world yeah, and, yeah. and then reframing the capitalist part of it, which I, I think it, there is a part of me that's like, oh, fuck it. I would be fine just making work in my studio, but I'm getting to the point where I don't want this stuff around me all the time. Mm -hmm. I would like it to have a life elsewhere. Yeah. I, I do like that it makes people happy or brings joy and there's evidence of something handmade. So if that means I make smaller pieces, I don't think that's a betrayal. Oh, no, I was I'm not, I'm not saying you're saying that I'm talking. No, to no, no, no. I was just I, I was just interested in how how ambitious the pieces are. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, if I really had my way, and I hope this happens soon, I would like to make big ass pieces that could live outside. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. And the other thing is that right now I'm working out of my house. I have nowhere near the space for anything. Yeah. Even, like that shit is is as big as one of my walls. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's like so, but it's crazy. So I know. Often I, it's like where you're working dictates what you can make. And yeah. also, I didn't know these were this big. Because I've seen them on Instagram. Yeah, I've seen your paintings. You yeah, know? I've seen. I've definitely seen that one for sure. And and yeah, I thought they were all more like this scale. Yeah. Maybe maybe I saw these and yeah. thought. But it's 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 just interesting, you know. Because I like the I like the necessity though leading to invention, even if it's from a capitalist perspective. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So there was a part of me I think because I'm sort of in an in between place on in, in the fabrication front. Like I love making these big pieces. These are gonna go. Mm. the pacific design center and so they'll have a life oh, nice. but it's inside but i'm in that in-between place of getting the work realized the way i want and so it was interesting that it kind of made me jump back over to painting and i could make something at a similar scale but without an, the engineering hurdles oh yeah okay so i see because there is uh, a relationship between them for sure they were almost like portraits but, of those pieces but i like how flat these are and how the volume yeah thank yeah, you yeah. yeah i like i like flat stuff I was thinking, I can't believe I'm quoting Harold Rosenberg, but he's talking about, he talks about flatness in painting. And like, I feel like that relates to what I was talking about, the evolution of painting throughout the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Like it eventually had to get to flatness. It's almost because there was so much. Three the Greenbergian. Yeah. Like it had, like that's part of the amazing part of painting is yeah, that yeah. it is two dimensional and these worlds are created. But I like the idea of creating something that's three dimensional into the, the flattest version of it yeah but no it's cool I, I really i really do enjoy I, it's also just nice to be in this space so sometimes yeah. it's nice to just like that's one of the things i'm realizing doing these yeah. is like sometimes it's just nice to be in a studio around someone's art and not yeah. even like have it be about the art but just be in its presence and you know i think those are the best studio visits i'm yeah. learning that someone yeah. comes in a gallery and we think we have to put on the speech but i think the most successful ones are where we just shoot the shit yeah yeah and then they can live with the work without pressure. It's yeah. actually nice for me to look at my work while I'm talking to you. Cool. Like it's part yeah. of the work. But I was going to say really quickly, I did a residency in Florida. The mm. only time I've been there, Atlantic Center. Have you ever been there? Atlantic Center where? In Atlantic Center for the Arts. It's um, New Smyrna Beach. <laughs> 
I've never even heard of New Smyrna. It's like it's like an hour uh, south, I think, of Daytona Beach. Ah, oh, dude, that's like that's no fly. I'm so fly. Oh, sorry. No, North North Florida is. I like, know nothing about. No, it. What's North Florida? North Florida is like anything past uh, Orlando. No, but what's the what is the like? It sounds like Northern California, Southern California. Just no, it's. I would say like Orlando. Orlando is considered Central Florida. Okay. So like, I would say. You're probably entering Central Florida as you get to West Palm Beach. Yeah. And then oh, really? West Palm Beach to like, I would say Jacksonville, you're already in North Florida. And so what is North Florida identity wise? We don't know. <laughs> we don't, we don't interact. Like it's a, it's a narrow, it's eight hours. It's, it, it really, oh, wow. yeah. It's, you just don't go there. No. Like the, is that, is Florida you know, man up there? Florida man's everywhere. Okay. Florida man. I mean, okay. North Florida's like Gainesville, Tallahassee. It's a lot wider. Uh, uh, a lot more country uh-huh. country boy, but not Southern. Not, I see. Not like, that's, that's the- just that's the mystique. redneck. I don't want to use that term Sorry. because I've- No, I, I, uh, because I, I, I don't even like, not that I think it's racist or anything. I'm not canceling it. I'm just saying like, I don't want to frame it like that because- I kind of like how crazy they, these people are. They're like, <laughs> they're characters from a Carl Hyacin book. Yeah. I recently saw a, a, a clip of the guy from, um, that directed Cocaine Cowboys talking about how crazy mm. Florida is. And he, mm. he also references Hyacin. Hyacin is like the guru for uh, Florida weirdness. He wrote, I didn't know he that. wrote striptease. He wrote a bunch oh, of stuff that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I know the name. I've never read anything. Yeah. It's, it is like basically he has stories where there's reporters and they're like every fucking reporter from the Herald that you've ever met. They're just as like sleazy and ambitious and like, yeah. you know. Uh, what it, is it about Florida? I don't know. But anyway, so Tallahassee, all those places are like swampy kind of um, at Gainesville in particular. It's like a college town, so it's empty most of the time, and then it's full with like uh-huh. young young kids. Wow. I would probably find it miserable right now because I'm just too old for that. But yeah. like when you're in your twenties, yeah, you know it's not bad. Yeah, like you're not you don't feel out of place there. Yeah. Uh, but I think like the rest of Florida, Florida, who knows? I I mostly that's so interesting. It's a you, big it, state. There's no destination there for us. Yeah, you know, like. The destinations are beyond in mm. like you're trying to get to Georgia, you're trying to get mm-hmm. to North Carolina, South Carolina. Yeah, you're passing through. Yeah. It was interesting that so we were there. The campus of that residency is a really nice residency, is beautiful. Um, but then it was uh, I was there in twenty sixteen, literally a month before the election. Mm-hmm. And it was there was like effigies of Obama hanging from trees and it was disturbing. Um, yeah, yeah. Trump signs everywhere. And then weird bars there was like the bar where that female serial killer arlene warnos yeah like you asked the right person <laughs> <laughs> it was like i don't know either it was her bar or like one of the bars where she picked people out yeah, yeah it's probably she didn't own a bar she, yeah no yeah. she didn't own a bar but it was like this weird cinder block we went there yeah, i mean yeah. it was weird but i was there it was like a that residency and plugging it because it was nice it's like it's three different cohorts you've got comics writing and music and then visual art and each that's one that's weird that's a weird mix isn't it ha- weird? comedians that's that's the way i mean comic books oh okay okay i was like but what I think it's, sometimes it can be different types of literature but yeah, ours yeah, was yeah. comics and then they've got like a head and then art six they choose six artists and we all work together you do your own stuff but it was an interesting experience and I was there with Sanford Biggers, but this is my long-winded way of talking about diversifying how you make, because he mm-hmm. has done huge statuary and says that the way he funds it is through the smaller mm-hmm. things. But I just think that's well, that's that's the that's what I learned from what's his name, the yeah. uh, Christo, Christo. Uh, they, yeah. He'd had a he had a retrospective at the National Gallery of Art when I was living in D.C. Yeah, and I was fucking really impressed. Like I was like, I oh, that. that's how you do this crazy wonky shit. Really, I didn't know that. Yeah. And I forget who it was, but there was a really interesting story. I think, oh no, you know what? I think the story didn't come from the show. It came from How to Draw a Bunny. Uh, yeah. uh, wh- what's his name? How to Draw a Bunny, the the guy. I can't, I'm blanking now. So he was an artist and he was a huge fan of Christo and he wanted uh, one of Christo's pieces hmm. and Christo sent him a piece and it had a note on the inside and, and um, he opens the piece and then the note says, 
hey, I sent you the piece, but unfortunately you opened it because his whole thing was, was wrappings, right? Yeah. Crystal's things. So he had given him a wrapping and he unwrapped it. Oh. And so it was like a nice little <laughs> game that he played like That's between funny. artists. And so I forget I forget what his name was. The the How to Draw a Bunny Guy. It's a documentary about I him. I can completely see. Johnson the... something. Daniel Johnson. No, Daniel Johnson's a musician. No, that's the, yeah. but, but what was the. Um, Ray Ramir? Johnson. Ray Johnson. No. I don't know. Anyway. Well, someone's going crazy right now. We should just move on. <laughs> someone's like, this is so boring. Yeah. No, someone's like, oh my God, it's fucking this guy. Oh. <laughs> I can see the script of it too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, so so he does the... Um, so I, I thought that was a cool story. So how did Christo... So so Christo basically did stuff, did smaller pieces and he would sell those to fund the project. I don't project. know if I've ever seen them. The You probably have. Uh, he did the 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 islands, the pink islands yeah. in Florida. Yeah. That he did the. Uh, I mean, I know the work. Oh, okay. The small pieces. I don't. Oh, know you've never seen the seen. small pieces. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I, the only time I've seen them is in there, you know. But then he has drawings of them and he has yeah. documentation of them. But yeah, it's really crazy. So so. That's how it works. I mean, that's another part of um, if we talk about relating coons with burger and bringing it all together. There's this beautiful and. The burger thing is uh, YouTube. You can see it all on YouTube. There's different chapters. But the, oh, sure. What's it called? Uh, Ways of Seeing. Ways of Seeing. Okay, I'll definitely it check it out. began as the BBC series, but then the book I love too because it flips between, like you can read it in any order. There's a, there's a chapter with text and then the next chapter is always only images. And so if you talk about like trying to understand someone's thesis, it's almost like the, the wall text theory. Like he's mm. letting you form your own assumptions. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, Oh shit! Burger, uh, bringing it back to the. Oh, so we're talking about how you fund these things. So he, he uses Rembrandt as a case study. Um, you know, he's someone who made money painting portraits of famous people, but then he, but so, and that's how he paid for his materials and all that kind of stuff in space. And then, but he was one of the most prolific self-portraitists. <laughs> There's just hundreds of them. Yeah. And it's so interesting when you see them sort of displayed in the text or the image section of that book because you just see this like. We talk about the juxtaposition between maybe a Kunzian approach where you're displaying the shiny object that is what the culture reveres. It is a value system. And then what does it look like to look at yourself and try to draw that? Mm. They're just really tragic and beautiful. But yeah, yeah. he was able to draw them because he participated in the economy the other way. Like, mm -hmm. that's just the way it is. Yeah. You know? No, I get it. I, I, I think. And, you know, uh, that's the. I'm, I've always been more of a conceptual artist. I do stuff that probably isn't going to sell, you know? Yeah. Like, that's really the thing that I get into. But I also draw, and I love drawing. Mm. Um, and then... Do you agree? Does it feel good to have a go and live with someone? or Have what? When you make a drawing, does it, are you feeling... I mean, I... I've, oh, to, to, to... Yeah, I I mean, I have no problem. I've definitely had people buy pages out of my sketchbook and stuff. Yeah. You know, where, like, I drew, I drew someone on a bus, and one time he was like, I want uh, 40 bucks right now. No way. Yeah, and I was like, oh, okay. I, I, I and that doesn't like, feel dirty. That feels... No, and it, it, I also was like, at that point, I was like, that's my sketchbook. You know, that's like a much mm. more personal thing than like... Yeah. Uh, but, you know... Those anyway. are always the things I love the most in museums. Yeah. Like pages from someone's sketchbook, but... Yeah, it was like, a, I did it on a bus. I drew it and he was like, yeah. he saw me and he, he, he was like, he looked at it and he was like, I want that. <laughs> I was mm. like, oh, shit. Yeah, which was really validating but uh but yeah i think that there is that level i think it's hard to live in a capitalist society and contribute labor to something that doesn't earn money and and yes and still feel the value in it and right yes. now where i'm in my life is i'm trying to be okay with it having value outside of monetary gain mm -hmm. while i'm also trying to sell stuff mm -hmm. so so it's like it's a different it's a different thing because it's the first time that i'm actually really thinking about making work that yeah. is consumable like that. I again, I where does this concept of selling out come from? You probably learned it from a teacher in some school yeah. that is coming from a very patriarchal yeah. 60s 70s kind of place. Yeah. Like whereas like now with, you know, I, back then maybe to sell out you had to go through a huge institution whereas like now you can just sell. Mhm. Mm now you are your own capitalist institution as long as you don't get censored. And in some ways, I think Instagram has democratized it in some ways because there are yeah. people that are just not defending Instagram, but it has made it. it there's no, it, you can directly be seen. Um, and not just even Instagram, all social media, you know, like I'm sure p even before Instagram came around, people were doing 
making sales off of Facebook and stuff like that. MySpace. MySpace, all of that shit. Yeah. But I think there, I wonder if this is back to mystification because I think we, someone was, this sounds very LA woo woo. Um, but thinking about monetary exchange as a being, it could be seen as a spiritual act in some ways. Like mm. you drew, did a drawing that connected to someone and he found, found it so valuable, it made him feel like he was participating in the experience by giving you something yeah. that represented the value. And now he gets to have it and enjoy yeah. it. How is that impure? Let's, no, I don't think, I don't. You know what I, I mean? Yeah, like, I, I feel agree. like seeing it that way isn't, is a, is a counter argument to the sellout I think thing. the purity thing has to do with a lot with academia. And I think yeah. part of the reason that that shit is dying out now is because most of us can't work in that industry yeah. or in that in that realm anymore. I don't know if you teach. I, Not I, anymore. Yeah. yeah. But like the competition is so high there. So like I think that part of that purity is most of these people already have day jobs or, 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 or into right. their structure. They have a yeah. financial backing. And so they can, they have the liberty to sort like if you have tenure and you're not worried about fucking losing your job, you can jerk off all you want on the canvas. You can write one novel and then yeah. wait seven years. Yeah, it's not about the product; it's about the. It's time. like working at the Intercept now, where you get like hundred <laughs> thousand uh, dollars from yeah. a billionaire, and then all you do is like make shit up. <laughs> yeah, but it, I, I think there's a, yeah, I think you're right. There's a myth about the starving artist that we like too. And yeah. we don't have a social value system in this country of supporting the arts, really. And we eradicated that even more in the 80s. In the 70s, you hear about everyone getting an NEA grant and like yeah. leaving their husband, like Ree Morton. She's like, I'm going to go be an artist. And you got all these NEA grants and teaching jobs and she was able to do it. Um, but I think so there's that mythology and that's how we justify um, the fact that we don't really support it. Like maybe. But then yeah, yeah. I see more and more. Uh, around me people making a living off of art like no one wants to be an adjunct that's a, that's a form of slavery i feel like academia I, I have a very naive notion about the academy of it being a place where you could go and think and make work without yeah. interruption and have the security of an institution but as i said before in the beginning boomers are they've destroyed tenure even though they had it yeah and they're not leaving those jobs and then they've created a culture of adjuncting which is just exploitative i did it for 10 years and yeah like not doing that anymore um but it's interesting because i wonder if it's also then freed people because i see so many people um the, some of the professors i had in grad school it felt like they traded something for tenure on yeah. some level and they were there to make art stars, but they didn't have the time to be their own because they're burdened with administrative yeah. duties now. It's become such a corporate model. But then I see people around me making a living at art and not in a dirty way, in a sellout way. So, yeah, what is even a sellout way? Like, what is that even? Yeah. I mean, to me, selling out would be something unethical. You know, like, 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 right. like, like you would be like fucking stealing your ideas and then making a living off of it, maybe. Yeah. So, that, I mean, I was going to go much darker. So I'm glad you put that one out because I was like <laughs> fucking like I was trying to work pedophilia into it. So oh. I, <laughs> I was going extreme. No, no. I mean, no, I mean, not. No, I wasn't. But I was oh, like, yeah, like, but I, you get what I'm trying to like. Yeah. I would, like th there's anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it, I mean, I, this is lovely. I, and now that we have a, a, a m batteries, I'm still tempted to continue talking about this. But uh, yeah, I mean, do, do you have anything that you wanted to add that maybe you've thought of but had, didn't get a chance to get out? I think it's interesting. I mean, I like the, the ending on this note about it because it feels like um, if we bring it back to Burger, because I do like to talk about that. No, I'm that glad that I'm there's something. Um, I guess because I see a lot of my friends doing so well right now, which is really great. Yeah. You know, I feel like there is something in the midst of all this chaos um, and people feeling a lack of agency in our political system. I also see there's this weird, maybe that's what art always does. It always finds the loopholes. Yeah. Artists, but I do see a certain amount of freedom there right now. But, and I, I, I'm glad that people are giving up on the dream of academia. I think even people are giving up on the dream of going to college too. So I think academia is not as smart as it used to be, yeah. or or maybe yeah, it was yeah. always dumb. Where did you go to college? Oh, I went to Florida International. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, it was not a great experience. I mean, I had a good te couple teachers, but overall, yeah. overall, yeah. that it, it was not it was uh, in Florida. Wouldn't do it again. Yeah, not there. I may do it. Yeah. I, I mean, I would probably still want my MFA, but probably not there. Yeah. Um, I mean, my BFA. I don't have an MFA. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I um 
I don't know. I feel like the art world is in an interesting place now. I think that I know a bunch of people that sell on Etsy. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think yeah. that's actually fucking better than not not than you not don't selling. Fifty percent away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They give something away. They no, they see. they yeah. give you. They, they, but it's still not as bad as fifty. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, the nice thing about that fifty split is that hopefully you can pad it. And the, <laughs> yeah, and the, uh, uh, you know the fifty percent probably should be considered the rate of them selling the work, and if they're not doing it, then they should fuck off. When it is, it is. I see more and more what that fifty percent encompasses, and then you see how the system. I don't know. It becomes less and less about the artist having to do it by their bootstraps. All that theory gets refuted. Like you see how people get profiles in magazines and news. You know, it's all very much. Yeah. It's a it's a very much a rigged system in that regard. Yeah, and which that's is the fifty percent. Yeah, I think that that's what I like about. Uh, you, have you 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 know Molly? So have, do you go to the Bendix and stuff? You're you have I haven't you, in a while, not since the pandemic, but yeah, I know. Okay, yeah, yeah cool. Because we the last the BLA Connect was the first time that we've been back like full fledged. Yeah, the whole cool. building, everything's been open. But um, yeah, I like I like people like Carl Barada and like yeah. do you know do you know Carl from TSALA? Uh-uh. He's the director there. He does high beams. There's yeah. a lot of people that are like like Molly Shulman. There's yeah. a lot of people that are really active in the scene. And Molly's so important too. I really admire what she's done outside or infiltrating within. Yeah, no, I mean, I yeah. I learned a lot from her. I yeah. learned how to do this from her. Yeah, like I was like, oh, I'm gonna do a similar thing. Yep. And uh, it's definitely helped me. I've been doing this for four years. I don't think in four years I would have gotten into Monta Vista if I didn't do this yeah. you know like I mean yeah. I can definitely like who knows it's it's an interesting it's an interesting um what if Th- the reality probably is, is that I don't have enough discipline and I would get burnt yeah. out too much from just doing the networking at galleries and I probably go yeah. for like a month get burnt out and then come yeah. home slows down the process this is like like, as I was pulling up here, I was like, hey, I'm going to make a new friend today. <laughs> I know. I feel the same way. Yeah. So I'm I, like. But I, I think that's the way networking really works anyway. Yeah. I think that we think it has to be more transactional than that. But I think most of the time, it's like any other industry, you show your friends, yeah. you know, you vibe and then you put them in a show. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's mostly that. I think there are. Well, right. this is transactional in that I expect you to promote it. Okay. <laughs> Done. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's an it's an interesting t- conversation. It's something that I'm very much in tune with right now because as I am committing more and more to doing this and trying to monetize this, I'm also like trying to monetize yeah. the art making as well. So We'll see. I'm definitely painting stuff that hopefully will sell. <laughs> yeah. But I love that we feel that's a possibility in the midst of everything else. I think because it is. Oh, People yeah. We're doing yeah. it. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think there's what a weird moment we're in because everything we yeah. talked about earlier is pretty depressing. Like there's a I also keep trying to. Say, I don't get depressed by that. I don't though. know if I'm actually even depressed by it either. I, I was going to clarify that. I feel like I felt this as a kid with like all of the Cold War rhetoric and everything. Like we were in the seismic moment and I feel like we are like it's been to be alive right now is to watch something. It's like the watching and even if you weren't there, the, uh, you know, the apex of it in the 50s, is I think, where the system really sort of had a moment where it could have been great, you know. Mm. Um, what, what moment was that? Not great, but like <laughs> almost for had, white people. <laughs> for, exactly, exactly. But if you talk about a tax structure and sort uh, of a social safety net, but yeah, then there's the yeah. yeah you know, one of the the labor movement in this country really fucked up by keeping black people out of labor. Mm-hmm. That was a really big fuck up. Yeah. In fact, if they brought black black people in, uh, like there would be it would be a whole different country. I think. Yep. I was talking about this with someone yesterday. Did you have you seen that meme going around about people don't want to work anymore? Yeah. <laughs> and then they like had the headlines going back to like 1890. <laughs> and we were talking about we're like, oh, it started in reconstruction. Yeah. And then we talk about a capitalist model, like, oh, suddenly you had to pay people. Yeah, yeah. People don't want to work anymore. Yeah. Because like, this the uh, the economic moment we're in right now, it's not gonna people aren't gonna stay calm about that. No. 
No, it's like it's the most ridiculous thing to have Joe Biden telling us that it's it's for the greater good. Like it's so dumb. It, it it's just so dumb. And we'll end on that. It it is all just so dumb. It is also dumb. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I'm glad I I made a new friend too. uh, Yeah, no, I'm very excited and we'll we'll check out some artwork and and stuff together at some point. Yeah. I'm I'm always going to be... You have an open invitation to, I I tend to go to every Monta Vista thing. Yeah, cool. That, so so you are you have an open invitation to come to that. Yeah. I think the next one is gonna be soon. We're I'm, I gotta draw some cats for that one. Oh, <laughs> we didn't even talk about cats. That's my other favorite. Topic. Oh yeah. I mean, actually, just my cat. Cat Catstagram really. is is one of my favorites. Do you have cats? No, but I I, I have an apartment that's too small. Hmm. one halloween i dressed up as that guy at the beach that has the cute puppy that is like trying to pick up girls that's so <laughs> funny i have to ask i have to say two things I, I i take my cat places in a backpack oh nice is it one of those that has this with a bubble mm-hmm. really is it mm-hmm. oh my god taking her hiking that's cool um and she comes here all the time in it wait do you let her out in the hike or she no. stays in the backpack she stays okay. in the backpack like looks everything and cool comes home and like struts like i saw the world what was the second thing have you ever read um, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay? No. Michael Chabon? No. You got to read it. It's, a, it's just an interesting thing about comic books and agency. Oh, okay. Cool. But, Text it to me so I don't yeah, forget. Yeah, well, and that's another topic. For yeah. Discussion. How, how, where can we send people so they can see your, your beautiful work and maybe get in contact with you if they sure. want to show it Instagram's or buy it? Instagram's probably the easiest way. It okay. It functions like a de facto website, although I have a website, which I don't maintain very well. But my Instagram is Megan, M-E-G-A-N underscore E underscore read, R-E-E-D. Oh, now I see. Now that you spell it, I see how it's Megan, but it's also Megan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me- Meg, Meg. Maybe it should have two E's. I don't know. That's what everyone always says. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm dyslexic, so I'm trying to work through it. <laughs> no, it, it would make sense. Yeah. All right. And your Instagram is at Megan underscore E underscore read, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. You can tell that I follow uh, closely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and thank you guys for watching the show. Uh, we'll be back next week with another artist and another topic that will uh, entertain us. Thank you. Bye-bye.